Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about the rhetorical triangle, uh, which is based in the work of Aristotle in the rhetoric. Um, Aristotle probably did not come up with the three concepts involved in the rhetorical triangle. And as far as I know, he doesn't refer to it as the rhetorical triangle, but this is a way that people tend to conceptualize this um, today for in contemporary rhetoric and composition studies. Um, the rhetorical triangle consists of the three classical appeals of ethos, pathos, and logos, each of which I've done videos on. There will be links down in the description below to those. Um, but basically, these are, according to Aristotle, the three ways in which you can convince someone of something the way you can persuade someone, which is the basis of rhetoric. So uh, I, I've read this in, I think, each of the videos for the three appeals, but I'm going to read it again uh, because this is central to understanding the rhetorical appeals and the rhetorical triangle. So Aristotle says, of the modes of persuasion furnished by the spoken word, there are three kinds. The first kind depends on the personal character of the speaker, the second on putting the audience into a certain frame of mind, the third on the proof or apparent proof provided by the words of the speech itself. Then a little bit later, he basically sort of reiterates this. He says, there are then these three meanings of if means of effecting persuasion. The man who is to be in command of them must, it is clear, be able, one, to reason logically, two, to understand human character and goodness in their various forms, and three, to understand the emotions, that is, to name them and describe them, to know their causes and the way in which they are excited. So the, that's the rhetorical appeals. But what's the rhetorical triangle? Because it's not just the three appeals. Each of the appeals stands on its own as its own thing. Ethos is one thing. Pathos is one thing. Logos is another thing. The rhetorical triangle is a way of conceptualizing the relationship between them in order to show uh, how they are interconnected and why each of the elements of, or why each of these appeals matters in terms of convincing an audience of something. So the rhetorical triangle is often um, depicted somewhat like this. Um, so this is a very simple version. This is a slightly more complex version. This is uh, still a slightly more complex version. And then uh, because of the way that this thing, there we go. Um, and then this is another, again, slightly more complex version. So ultimately what, what the rhetorical triangle basically is, if we go back to the simplest version, it is a triangle shape with each of the three rhetorical appeals labeled at one of the corners. Sometimes they're along the sides. So logos might be here, ethos here, pathos here, whatever it is, but that's a little more unusual. This is typically the way that I've seen it done. And in all of these examples, this is the way that it's done. Again, sometimes these are more detailed. You get sort of basic descriptions of what each of these elements are. But the really important thing about the rhetorical triangle, as opposed to the individual rhetorical appeals, is the lines that connect them. Because each appeal is connected to the other two, right? So here's pathos. It is connected via this line with ethos and via that line with logos. Logos connected to pathos over here, connected to ethos over there, ethos connected to each of them, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really the, the reason why the rhetorical triangle is a visually important representation of this concept. Because, <clears throat> I think we've got the, the gist now, because none of these rhetorical appeals function without the other two. And that may seem somewhat counterintuitive given that each of them is its own thing, right? Ethos deals with the credibility, trustworthy, goodwill, etc. of the speaker. Pathos evokes emotional responses from the audience by appealing to their values. 
And Logos puts evidence into a rational, argumentative frame in order to reason convincingly. The problem is none of them stand on their own, right? So it, we can sort of illustrate this with a couple of um, examples. So let's take, for instance, the famous ASPCA commercial with the Sarah McLaughlin song in the background, one of the, the most famous examples of a pathos-driven text. It is pathos to the max. And yet, there are elements of ethos, right? The ASPCA is a trustworthy organization. It is an organization with a reputation for helping and supporting abused animals. Um, so they have credibility. They have ethos. Um, Sarah McLaughlin, famous celebrity. This is what we call star power, which is a version of ethos. Um, not necessarily the most reliable version of ethos, but nonetheless a very compelling one in many cases. So there's ethos in this pathos-driven commercial. There's also logos. We, give, we get some concrete details, and then we have an argumentative structure, at least implicitly, which is give us money via donations and you can help prevent the suffering of these animals. All of the pathos stuff is used as evidence that's put into the logical structure of because you value not having animals suffer, doing what we want you to do helps you achieve that goal. If it was just about making us sad, then we wouldn't donate to the ASPCA, would we? We wouldn't be motivated to do that. We would feel sad. We would not like that. But what the argument of the, the commercial actually is, is give us money and you will not feel sad as much anymore. Uh, we can take another text, something very, very logos driven, for instance. Um, <clears throat> a report on Municipal infrastructure. Uh, you're a you're a city planner or whatever it is. You're a city engineer, whatever it is. You have to write a report about the state of your town's infrastructure. This is going to be a logos driven thing. It, that what they want is just the facts, Pam. They want the information, concrete specifics. What is what's the state of the roads? What's the state of bridges? What's the state of whatever it is that goes into a municipal infrastructure report. I have no idea. But <clears throat> even within that, where the document itself is very, very logos driven and very, very focused on providing concrete information, you still have ethos. You have to have credibility. We have to trust that you and your sources and your measurements or observations, whatever it is, that all of those things are trustworthy. If we don't trust that your observations, your measurements, you yourself as an author are credible, reliable, knowledgeable, et cetera, et cetera, then we're simply going to disregard the information. We're not going to believe it because we don't believe you. The evidence is not going to stand on its own and the argumentation is not going to stand on its own if we don't trust the source, if we don't trust the person speaking. Um, and similarly, this is going to have an element of pathos in that you would assume that the people who commissioned the report, presumably town council or whatever it is, um, care about the state of the town's infrastructure. So you you have to sort of appeal to that value. You have to to even if you're not making a specific recommendation, which I actually think is kind of the norm, like here are recommendations for maintenance or improvements or things like that. I think that's not unusual at all in these types of reports. But even if you're not doing that, you still have to assume that they care about the municipality, that they are fundamentally concerned with um, with the upkeep, the maintenance, the safety of citizens, et cetera, et cetera, all of which <clears throat> is rooted in their values. And so you have to appeal to their values and convince them that 
um, that your data matters as far as those things that care, that they care about go. So this is the thing. I can't build an ethos based argument without some evidence, right? Without some argumentation. So I need logos. You won't trust me if I provide you with no, no evidence and no argumentation. You won't, uh, and you won't trust me if I'm not appealing to you, your values, your beliefs, your emotional responses. If I'm not connecting with you as a reader, listener, viewer, whatever it is, you aren't going to trust me. Similarly, I can, again, provide you with great evidence and great reasoning, but if you don't trust me, if you think I am lying, if you think I don't have your best interests at heart, whatever it is, then you're not going to trust the evidence that I give you. You're not going to trust the logic of my conclusions. And if you, uh, and, and, um, if you don't care about the thing that I'm arguing about, if you, if you have no stake in it, if you have no emotional connection to it, again, you're not going to be persuaded. You might say, yeah, okay. I accept that you're probably right, but I don't care. I'm not going to do the thing that you want done that you're trying to convince me of because I don't care. I am not moved to take any action. Um, and then, and then pathos appeals. If you don't trust me, you're not going to trust my attempts to, to appeal to your values and to evo evoke your emotions, right? If you believe that I don't have your best interests at heart, it's going to be very hard for me to get you on my side. Like, like you're, even if I sort of say, oh, I believe in the same things that you do, patriotism or equality or compassion or religious values or whatever it is you're not going to be emotionally moved by that if you assume that I'm lying to you. And then at the same time, if I attempt to make emotional appeals to you, to, to appeal to your values, but I offer you no evidence of any kind, and this is evidence broadly conceived, um, if I offer you no evidence, no reasoning, whatever it is, you might experience an emotional reaction. But again, you're not going to be moved to do whatever it is I want you to do because I haven't, I haven't convinced you of the validity of the message, of the validity of the thing that I want done. So this is the thing that's important about the rhetorical triangle. And it's the thing that really, um, really matters when you're thinking about the rhetorical appeals individually is that they aren't individual. It's not ethos, pathos, and logos. It is ethos, pathos, and logos, all connected, all intertwined, and none of them function without the others there to support them. Even though some documents are going to be very heavily reliant on a particular type of appeal, they nonetheless require at least minimal components of the other two appeals in order to be rhetorically effective.